So far, we've gone through 1 Peter, all five chapters. We've gone through 2 Peter, chapter 1 and chapter 2. And today we come to the last statements that Peter will make while living on this earth. It's 2 Peter, chapter 3. So grab your Bible and let's jump in. Hey, thanks so much for being with us today at 316, a Bible study of Bridgeway Church out of Wesley Chapel, Florida. If you're a regular with Bridgeway, welcome back. Thanks for being with us for this study of 1 Peter and 2 Peter. If possibly you're new with us, my name is Joel Eason and I serve as the senior pastor at Bridgeway. And uh, we're thrilled to be connecting with you for this study. If you've missed the others, we'd love to have you listen back to our full study of 1 Peter, as well as the two chapters before this one of 2 Peter chapter 1 and chapter 2. And if these Bible studies are a blessing to you, we'd love to have you listen back to a variety of other studies. We've gone through all of Paul's letters, and uh, I think they would be a uh, help and a blessing to you. But today we are in 2 Peter chapter 3, and uh, we're going to go ahead and just jump straight in. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, Peter writes this. This is the last chapter that he's going to be writing. It says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Now, let me just kind of unpack a couple of things and we're going to capture back, okay? So we're remembering that Peter is finishing this letter here, but he is reflecting back. He's recalling, I've written you two letters. Now, if we grab a hold of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, he explained where he was writing. And 1 Peter, the first letter, chapter 1, he says who he's writing to. He's writing to Christians that were scattered and they were scattered throughout Asia Minor and they were suffering because of being scattered. Now, I'll show you just that map. We've done this every lesson so far, uh, but you can see over in this red area defined as Bithynia and Pontus and Asia and Galatia and Cappadocia. Uh, so he identifies these in 1 Peter chapter 1. He is in Rome, he is imprisoned in Rome, and he is writing to scattered Christians. And the reason that's important for us is he knew what it was like to be scattered out of Jerusalem. We see that in the book of Acts. He knows what it was like to be a persecuted church in Antioch or in the pursuit up there. We read in the book of Acts about his time in Caesarea. We read about Saul of Tarsus pursuing the them and uh, eventually becomes the Apostle Paul. I would just contend that Peter knows a lot about what it is to suffer. He knows a lot about what it is to be scattered and he's writing these letters to the Christians to encourage them uh, to be uh, continuous in their faith and to be um, persevering so to say. And then after he writes 1 Peter, he follows up with a second letter, which would have been uh, 2 Peter. And he says in, um, in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, he reminds them that even though they're scattered, that their faith was as precious as the apostles' faith. That's important because when we suffer, we don't feel that our faith is all that strong. We feel like if I had better faith, I wouldn't be suffering. If I knew the Lord more, I wouldn't be going through this. And Peter is reminding them that you have as precious of, precious of a faith in the Lord as we do. And so therefore make every effort to add to your faith, even while you're going through persecution or suffering or all these things. He reminds them that if you get your eyes off of this, you can be unsettled, you can fall. He talks about that in chapter 1. And so he reminds them, it's wise to be reminded of truths that you know. Real important chapter there. And uh, he finishes chapter one 
by reflecting on the words of the prophets that are confidence, but that they were eyewitnesses to the Lord and that they have even a greater testimony as eyewitnesses to the Lord. It's not discounting Old Testament. It's not discounting the prophets. It's depicting that we had the prophets and we hold to that, but we have a more true testimony in that we were eyewitnesses of the Lord himself. Chapter 2 is going to pick up on the fact of false teachers, and he's going to say that there were false prophets in the Old Testament. We know that without fail. And he's going to say that there were false teachers amongst the early church. So for us today, we should never be surprised when there's uh, when there seems to be error or people teaching stuff that's inappropriate or just biblically not sound. He said, that's going to happen, so you should be alert and you should be aligned. Um, He is going to lean heavily on the ones that have really, really poor motives. Now, this is very important at this point to remember both 1 Peter and 2 Peter. When we looked at those towns that they were sent to, they were sent not to one particular congregation and not to one particular person. They were sent to the region, so they were open letters This letter was sent in to be read aloud in the churches in those areas or into the homes of church community folks, Christians. So just imagine an open letter being read in these areas, both 1 Peter, 2 Peter, both open letters being read regularly. And if you were a false teacher in that area, can you imagine the tension that would be established when this letter from the Apostle Peter, authenticated, being read aloud, this is the word of the Apostle Peter, and he's teaching or declaring for us to live godly, but also to be mindful, you have false teachers among you, and they have wrong motives, and they will be bring destructive heresies. If you were a false teacher, you'd have been sweating bullets. If you thought you had a false teacher in your presence, you'd be eyeing him down while this letter is being read. And Peter's talking in chapter 2 about their motives, that it's very selfish, it's greed-based. You can read that in chapter 2. And he also talks about God's response, and he's going to highlight what happens to angels. He's going to highlight what happens in Noah's day of judgment. He's going to highlight what happens in Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, then from that, he's also going to talk about how they will mock and slander even angels. And so he's really coming down strong in chapter 2, and he's depicting that judgment is coming to them. Make no mistake about it. So from that is when, you know, we're reading here in chapter 3, he's coming off of that. So in this open letter, he's saying, dear friends, he's hoping that the false teachers are hearing what he's saying, but he's also hoping that the true believer is hearing what he's saying. This is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate to wholesome thinking. Now, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets, that's Old Testament, that's assured and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. So he is he is trying to remind them to be anchored to these things. Now one of the things that uh, false teachers and deceivers would often come in and try and trick the church. This happens with Thessalonica, with Paul's Paul's influence in Thess- the, the church in Thessalonica is that false teachers will come in and say, okay, so where is the Lord? Y'all are talking about him coming back. Where is he? And so the return of the Lord becomes a very debatable topic in the early church. You think about in our present day, that's a debatable topic today too. People say, well, where is he? If he's coming back, if the Lord's coming back, where is he? So that's exactly what he says here next. He says, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires make no mistake they are following their own evil preferences and perceptions they will say where is this coming he promised like we've been waiting around a long time i don't see any lord coming back and even with the church in thessalonica that paul dealt with there were people saying that he had already come back that jesus had already come back And uh, so that is something that has been true throughout history where people say, 
you know, ah, he's already come back, or, uh, you know, somebody who is a false, false leader in a cult might say, I'm the Messiah come. And we've all seen, you know, the newsreels on that kind of junk. But then there are people that scoff. Teachers will scoff, scientists will scoff, just people will scoff and say, well, where is the Lord? If he's coming back, where is he? Why hasn't he come back? That's exactly what Peter's addressing. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it is since the beginning of creation. That's what they're depicting. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. So it's interesting that that while Paul had said, in the last days, people are going to be lovers of themselves. In Peter's context, he's going to identify they're, they're pursuing their own evil desires. And their own evil desires or lovers of themselves, as Paul would say, it's going to surface these kinds of statements. Where is he? And Peter, in this context, says, listen, we, we have all kinds of evidence. We have creation. We have the heavens before us uh, being the stars and everything that we can see. And that is evidence of God's creation. Even if he is slow in returning, as we would define it, we still have evidence, but they are deliberately forgetting. Now, Paul had some very similar things to say in uh, Romans, and I won't be showing this verse, but I'll just read it. So he said in Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godless, godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. So that's uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. So it's a strong statement of saying, you know, you look at creation, you look at what is before you. And men are without excuse. And people can say, well, I don't think, and this and that, and all kinds of hemming and hawing. Peter and Paul would both say it's coming from their own evil motives, and they scoff at the Lord even though there's evidence of his, of his creation. And so from that, he continues on, he says, by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. He's reaching back to creation once again. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. And so Peter here is in simple terms acknowledging, I think, um, a much wider lens. He has, he has taken the lens set not so much just about, okay, I haven't seen the Lord return today. And he is saying that God was fully active before creation, God was fully active in creation, during creation, and all that came from creation, and he will be fully active in the end. I think Paul or Peter here is widening the lens here, okay? And uh, he's trying to, in my opinion, he has been in this open letter challenging the false teacher, but he's trying to more so strengthen the person that is having to wade through uh, the scoffing of some men and some people. He says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. He, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And that's, um, you know, when you think about what are famous verses in the New Testament, those are two that are pretty, pretty famous. You know, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. And uh, the Lord is is slow in, in keeping some promises because he wants people to repent. He wants to draw them to repentance. And so when we when somebody pulls back and say, okay, so where's the Lord? Why doesn't he come? You've probably heard people that, you know, okay, if God exists, then I, I challenge him to strike me dead. That's some of the silliest nonsense that, that could be said from a person. Um, that is a complete abdication of anything that is of the nature of God and how God responds. It is so silly to say stuff like that. But here, there's something important for you and me uh, about God 
in the nature of this line, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. This should not be defined as an exact equation of time. What is being pushed here is that God is not confined to linear time like we are confined to linear time. So he is as close to one day as he is to a thousand years. He is as close to a thousand years as he is to a day. And while we can't, we can't process that outside of a linear scope, he is not confined to that in the slightest. Now, uh, I'll, I'm going to read you a set of quotes, but it is a great, great line by uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, speaker of, of old, a very famous preacher. Uh, but he said, all time is equally present with God. So a day is as present to God and God is as present to a day as he is to a thousand years. Something that will happen in a thousand years or something that happened a thousand years ago is as close to God, is as present with God as right now. That kind of blows our mind because we think in linear time. But listen to the set of statements that were made when, when Spurgeon said this. So he said, we remark that all time is equally present with God. When we know that an event is to transpire today, it appears very near to us. But when we know that it will not occur until a thousand years have elapsed, we think nothing of it. We feel that we shall have gone to our graves long before that era. And therefore, the event does not strike us as having any connection with ourselves. Now, it is not so with God. All things are equally near and present to his view. The distance of a thousand years before the occurrence of an event is no more to him than it would be the interval of one day. With God, indeed, there is neither past, present, nor future. He takes for his name, I am. It's an astonishing and deep kind of understanding of things. Now, consider that for a moment. So consider that all time is equally present with God. That makes grace and that makes sin all the more poignant. Like when we think about sin and uh, sin can um, sin can be something that is in someone's past and they did something 20 years ago and uh, they can feel guilty the day of, but 20 years from now, maybe they don't feel guilty by it and they feel, ah, it's 20 years ago. I mean, you know, uh, we have, we have laws in this land that allow for a certain period of time, you know. But with God, even if a thousand years passed, he is as present to it as when it first occurred. And the same thing pertaining to grace. Sometimes we receive grace. We're the recipients. We say yes to the Lord, what he, the Holy Spirit leads us to. And there's just a flood of grace in our lives. But then down the road... We lose our cool, lose our thoughts, we do things, say something, whatever, and we start beating ourselves up and we think somehow we've expired the grace. Like, well, you know, so much time has passed. You're as, with God's way of timing, you're as close to it as the first moment. So it's a real interesting way of thinking. So we go back to that verse and we say, you know, you can understand why it would say he is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. If, if you were to give somebody a thousand years waiting for them to turn, you would say, well, that's way too long. Would you give them one minute, one moment? We'd say, yes, God's as close to the one moment as he is to the thousand years and vice versa. It's a really powerful statement. So Peter's statements here are encouraging the believers to be strong and they're waiting for the Lord. So we continue on. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. So when that day does come, it'll come like a thief, being it'll be unexpected. And, um, and he says, uh, the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And uh, the Gospels use this visual of the day of the Lord coming like a thief. The, Re the book of Revelation does. Paul's letter uh, in First Thessalonians chapter 5 all utilize the visual of a thief coming in the night. And it's not so much about the thief, it's about in the night without warning. Jesus gives the parable of the 
It's called the parable of the ten virgins. Five are ready and five aren't. Five are waiting and ready. Five have fallen asleep, don't have oil in their lamps. And the depiction is to be ready. To be ready for the Lord. And so all of this is going to be pointing into how they live. Peter's push is to live in such a way that you're ready for the Lord, that you're honoring to the Lord. So he says here um, in the next statement, uh, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in heat. So it's a very strong statement. I do think in a context that Peter's grabbing back to some of Jesus' own words, in my opinion. So Peter was witness to Jesus' teachings on things like obedience and life and the kingdom of God and a variety of things. Um, but he was also witness to Jesus' teaching on end times. And uh, Jesus had a number of things to teach and say about end times. I'll read just one section. This comes out of Matthew chapter 13. And, um, and he says in verse 36, Then he left the crowd being Jesus and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And I'll let you read for it. The parable is very simple. But he says, He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom of God. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. So we're in times, and the harvesters are angels. So there will be angels involved with this. We see these kinds of things out of um, what is the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, and we read about these things in Revelation. But he continues, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire. This is a very, he's using a lot of metaphor, but fire was often in the teaching around end time things. So it will be at the end of the age. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. That's verse 40. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Uh, my opinion is that Peter is reflecting back on some of Jesus' own words here, and he's being very depictive of it. So therefore, we have a response to how we live. That's an interesting statement that's highlighted. So in consideration of the end, in consideration of the coming of the Lord, in consideration of God's patience with timing, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives and not align with the scuffer, not align with, well, God hasn't shown up yet, so I don't think he's going to, so I'm going to do whatever I want. No, you ought to live a godly life according to the nature of who he's called you to be. So he continues on, but in keeping with his promise. So once again, I said, I think he's reflecting on Jesus' words because he comes here and he says, but in keeping with his promise. He's reflecting back to Jesus, but in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. And uh, so this is a powerful statement, and it's here as he's starting to wind down this letter, not the chapter, but the letter. He then turns this open letter back to the focus, and those are his friends. Those are believers, people that have a precious faith. He says, so then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. And so it's a real beautiful statement. Now, he does something here that is really intriguing to me. He's going to take a couple of final swipes at the false teachers, but he's going to say something that I think uh, could be, maybe should be, encouraging for a lot of us. And, uh, and I'll, I'll pose the question to you after we read it. He says, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. So he knows that Paul has written. Paul had written to Galatia. Paul has written to a number of places, right? 
He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort. So he takes another swipe at the false teachers that they're ignorant and unstable, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. But I'm interested in that one part that's highlighted on your screen there. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Let me ask you honestly. You show your hand because nobody's seeing you, right? Are there ever times that you read the scriptures, you read something Paul wrote, or you read something that Jesus said, or you read something out of the scriptures, and you're like, that's hard to understand. I don't fully get it. Like, I'm trying to, but I don't fully get it. Um, Peter said of Paul's letters, his letters contain some things that are hard to understand. And Peter is defined as the guy that was the father of the early church. You know, some people say he was the first pope. You know, so if you struggle with understanding some of the scriptures, don't beat yourself up. The Holy Spirit's the one who inspired men to write and gave inspiration to what was to be written. Um, but some of that is difficult to understand at times, and the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and teaches us. But I just find a comfort out of that. If you don't feel like you're a great Bible scholar, don't beat yourself up by it. Still go back to the simple things of, I'm going to love the Lord, I'm going to try and love other people, and I'm going to try and live my life in a way that's honoring to Him. So we're landing here with the last statements. He says, Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure p position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. And it's with that that Peter's letter concludes. He says, Be on your guard. Be on your guard and grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. Now, I want to leave you with one last thing, okay? And to do so, I'm going to come back to 2 Peter chapter 1. And something that he said from the very beginning that I think is very important out of all that he wrote in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. He wrote this. He said, I always remind you, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them are firmly established in the truth you now have. And he says, I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. So he's talking about as long as I'm alive in this body. Because I know that I'll soon put it aside. So our Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear to me. And I'll make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So we said early on that Peter is writing from a Roman prison. And we know, as best history can show us, that Peter never made it out of this prison. He was never freed, and he would be martyred there in Rome. And so the day that he would depart and leave this body, leave this tent, was very soon. But his words to them of, I remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in them, in the truth that you now have. Uh, I find that they were as important for that church that was suffering or scattered as they are for us, and they're as important for us as they were for them. If you're going through tough things, if you feel scattered, if you feel like you're suffering, if you have somebody that scoffs because you're a believer, if you have somebody that persecutes you, if you have somebody that makes it difficult on you, uh, to to live and to be a, a godly Christian. They scoff at your purity or they scoff at your ethics or they scoff at, at your generosity to help other people or they scoff at this weird belief that you have that the Lord truly is going to come back. They scoff at your theology. I think First Peter and I think Second Peter would be a great study for you to come back to again go through and be reminded of the truth that you already know while you remain and while you follow him. I pray and hope that this study of, of, uh, of 1 Peter and 2 Peter has been a blessing to you 
And I pray that you would be strengthened and that you would make that decision that Peter calls for the believers to make, and that is to fully devote yourself to following the Savior. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I love getting to share time with you. Now, if you're watching this present day, you know that we're in uh, in November of 2022 and about to have Thanksgiving. Next week, we're going to do one more. I'm going to do the book of Jude. I said last week that Second Peter runs very parallel to the book of Jude. So I'm going to do a quick study next week on the book of Jude, and then that'll conclude our study in 316 for 2022, and uh, we'll be coming back in 2023 with a whole new set of studies. So I hope to see you uh, next week, and uh, with that said, God bless you, and uh, we'll see you very soon.